I have brought with me today a bunch of exam review questions, but um, before those, or even during those, um, is there any question anyone would like to ask me uh, about the course content? So is there anything that was unclear that you would like to clarify now before we, we get to the exam? No? Okay, good. Um, so I don't think that that, I don't believe that that means you think you understand everything from the course. I think you just don't have a question ready or, uh, or don't, uh, don't want to ask a question in, in public. Um, but maybe when we start looking at a few of these, uh, these exam review questions, we'll, you guys will participate a little bit. Um, so I've already told you what the structure of the exam is, how many, uh, how many uh, questions are devoted to each topic. And so, uh, so we'll go just through a, a list of sample questions. This is already uh, in the shared directory, this list of questions. Um, we'll answer some of them, and for study work, you can answer some of the other ones. I guess, um, yeah, and so the, the way to use these things, and the way we'll use them is, you know, most of these questions have Python code in them, and, you know, the way to find out, they may ask you what this code does, or something about this code. So the way that to answer that is not to fire up Python and then paste that code into the Python interactive mode. Uh, that's not going to help you prepare for the exam because on the exam, the point is that you can read code and understand what it does without having to use, uh, having to use the interpreter to, to test it. So um, let's see what these things uh, start with the easiest ones. Uh, these follow basically the same order that things will happen in the exam. And, but the only topic missing from here is Java, and that's because you've just done, well, uh, some fraction of you have just done two assignments in Java, so that should be uh, the most familiar thing and something that doesn't need a, a review at this point. Um, so, what does this evaluate to in Python? Uh, sorry, I should mention... Uh, and this will be written on the exam too. Everything is done with from future import division or minus Q. Um, yeah, so what does this evaluate to? 1 over 6. Is that right? Zero point five. So which operation do you do first? Slash, division, or multiplication? And why is that? Yeah, so division and multiplication, so bed mass is not a good one for this. Uh, they're at the same level of precedence. left to right order, yeah. So, um, so division and multiplication have the same order of precedence, and so you do things left to right. So 1 divided by 2 is 0 0.5, 0 0.5 times 3 is 1.5. So the answer you get is 1.5. And with the, the future import division business, uh, this really, this 1 divided by 2 really gives you 0 0.5 and not 0. 2 mod 6, 2, okay, so take 2 and divide it by 6, you get 0 and a remainder of 2, so the answer is 2 here. 3 plus 4 is less than 3,511 mod 7. True or false? False. Why false? Yeah. So what's 3 plus 4? 7. What's this thing? 
It's between 0 and 6. So um, you take a number mod 7, you get a number that's between 0 and 6. And so uh, 7 is not less than 6, or 5, or 4, or 3, or 2, or 1, or 0. So the answer is false. So there's no need to actually evaluate this expression on the right. You just need to know that it's something between 0 and 6 to, to answer this question. OK. So x plus y, what does that evaluate to if x and y are both of type int? Int. Uh, what if x is an int and y is a float? Float. What if x is a string and y is a string? String. Um, what if x is a string and y is an int? It's an error. So you can't add a string and an int. We can check that. So it tells you can't concatenate string and int objects. Um, and what if x is an int and y is a string? Yeah. So in that case, we'll get I think it's a slightly different error message, but it's an error message nonetheless. Unsupported operands for plus, int and string. x times y. If x and y are both ints, that's an int. If x is an int and y is a float, float. If x is a string and y is a string, error. So there's no obvious definition of what it means to multiply two strings. Um, and so indeed, you get an error. Just check that. That's a syntax error. Can't multiply sequence of non by non-int of type string. Um, what if x is an array or a list and y is an int? You get a list, right? And what's the list that you get? Yeah. So you get basically, um, if you take two arrays and add them together, you get their concatenation. And so if you take an array and multiply it by an integer, it's like adding the array to itself that many times. So you know, x equals uh, 1, 2, 3. Uh, and then say x times 3, you get 1, 2, 3 repeated three times. Which is the same thing as x plus x plus x. Um, and what if x is a string and y is an int? String. And it's exactly the same rules for arrays and strings. Both of them are sequences. Um, and so they behave the, the same way for uh, the operations of addition and, uh, and multiplication. So you'd get the string x repeated that many times. So here's a piece of code. Not too difficult. Um, what's the return value if I call that function with the arguments the string pat, the string morin, and the integer 2019? What does the... Uh, what does the output look like, or what's the return value? Like that? Yep. Looks good to me. So, um, why is the 2019 formatted exactly this way? Yeah, so we divide it by 100, which seems to suggest that it's an amount in cents. And, uh, and then the string formatter that we use is this 0.2f that says two decimal places exactly. So then what about this next line? Yeah. It looks
look like that. <coughs> okay. And you can figure out the last one. What's that? I don't, I don't get it. Oh, does the zero appear? Yeah. That's a good question. Let's see. Um, yeah, you do get the zero. So it looks like that. Okay. Um, here's another easy function. Suppose I call it with the argument 6.25. So first of all, what kind of thing gets returned by this function? Is it a string? Is it a number? It's a, it's a pair of things, so it's a, it's a tuple of length 2. So if I call it with 6.25, what's the, the first thing in that pair? Six. And what's the second thing? Three. So three. In fact, three point zero in this uh, this case. Okay. So why is that? Well, six point two five divided by one, and throwing away the remainder is just six. Um, so that's where you get the six. And over here, uh, 6.25 modulo 1 is 0.25, and then 0.25 times 12 is 3. So that's where that comes from. Um, how about the second one then? So 12, 0, and 2.5. Six and seven thirds. So two and a third. Um, so a third of a foot is, uh, or point three 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 feet. Is, uh, is four inches, right? So um, this is a four point, you'll get the zero there. Okay. Here's three implementations of the factorial function. So tell me about the running times of these things as a function of n. So let's start with this second implementation here. What's the running time as a function of n? O of n, right? So here I see a loop that counts from 1 up to n. Everything else is just basic operations. So what kills you is the loop, and there's n iterations. So this runs in O of n time. Um, how about this one down here? So if you remember what reduce does, you give it a list and a function, and the function has to take two arguments. In this case, it's the function that takes the arguments x and y and multiplies them together, and then it applies it to uh, the first two elements of the list, and then the result of that gets applied to the, that and the third element of the list. So in this case, we, the list we give it is the list of integers 1 through n, and reduce will compute 1 times 2. And it'll take that result and multiply it by 3, and then it'll take that result and multiply it by 4, and that result and multiply it by 5, and so on. Um, so what's the running time? What's that? Yeah. Yep. Oh, it should be 6.0, yeah. That's me being lazy.
So this reduce function, if I ask you to reduce an array of length n, how long does that take? O of n. So it's basically just doing, you know, hidden inside the reduce function is a for loop that goes through the array, multiplying things and accumulating uh, values. Um, okay, so that's also O of n. And now what about this recursive one? This recursive function that says if n equals 0, return 1. Otherwise, return n times factorial of n minus 1. So if I call that, for example, with the argument 5, n equals 5, what's going to happen? Yeah. So there, the one with n equals 5 is going to call, call it again with n equals 4, which is going to call it again with n equals 3 which is going to call it again with n equals 2, which is going to call it again with n equals 1. Now, inside this function, excluding this recursive call, there's nothing fancy, right? We check if something is equal to 0, and we do one multiplication, but nothing takes more than constant time. And so what really matters is how many times the function gets called. And in this case, well, we just argued it gets called O of n times. So, um, so all three of these functions have the same running time. Um, so for which values of n do they work? So this top one here, this recursive version of factorial, for what values of n does it work? So it works for 0. Um, how about negative numbers? Yeah, if we start with a negative number, like minus 1, then we'll call it on minus 2, and then call it on minus 3, and minus 4, and minus 5. We'll never get down to 0. So we certainly need that uh, n is bigger than or equal to 0. And is there an upper bound on n? Yeah, so we saw that if we write recursive functions that have a depth of about roughly more than 998, if they recurse more than 998 times, or more precisely, if the recursion depth is more than 998, they'll crash. So this implementation uh, only works for a fairly small range of n, between 0 and 998. How about this implementation? Well, so it's not clear what factorial should even be for negative numbers, um, but it will return something. It won't crash, at least. So we'll say, you know, anything bigger than, uh, than 0, bigger than or equal to 0, certainly works. And there's no upper bound here, right? This, this function just, uh, we can give it any value of n, and we're not going to have a problem with this thing crashing because of uh, recursion depth or, or anything like that. How about this third one? So what, what's the smallest value of n that this works on? Yeah. So here, the claim is that you have to have n bigger than or equal to 1. It doesn't work for n equals 0. And why is that? Well, for, to know that, you have to look at this reduce function and understand how it works. So what does the reduce function do? Um, it takes an array. And while the first, it creates an accumulator. Um, so that accumulator, for example, will hold the value, you know, in this case, 1 times 2, and then it'll hold that value times 3, and then it'll hold that value times 4, and so on. Um, but it has to initialize that thing. And to initialize it, it needs at least one element. So the array has to have at least length 1. So if we try and call reduce on an empty array, it has no idea what to return. Right? It's supposed to... Uh, it's supposed to just keep applying this function to consecutive pairs of elements in the array, but it can't even have, it doesn't even have one element to, to work with. So it'll just return an error if you try and, uh, and give it an empty list. And so if I take, uh, 
if I take n equals 0 in this case, then this list is empty and I get nothing. I get an error. Okay. Another easy function. Um, so the question is, what does it return? And, you know, start with the most, uh, the most vague answer you can. What kind of thing does it return? What's that? A string? Nope, not a string. So it returns a list. The, the square braces are the, the clue for that. And what's in the square braces are a list comprehension. Now, why do you say it only returns one value? Yeah, so this list A here, it takes as argument what appears to be a list A. And why do I think it's a list? Well, because it, uh, it, it does 4x in A, right? Well, and in our, all our examples, A is almost always going to be a, a list, yeah? Yeah, you can give it a string. In fact, you can give it anything of what in Python is called a sequence, anything that you can iterate over. Um, so a string is one of those. And, okay, so it's going to return a list that it's going to derive from this input list A. And what are the elements of that list? Strings. Strings. And what kind of strings? Or what? So the elements are all going to look like this, right? Some string mod or uh, printf x. And then the, the format is this percentage r. Anybody remember what percentage r does? What's that? Yeah, so it can take anything and it returns a Python representation of that thing. So if you give it, if, if x is a string, it'll give you back a string with the quotes around it um, to show that it's a string. If x is an integer, it'll just give you the integer. And for more complex things, it, it calls the, uh, this function that we've maybe written once, it calls this representation uh, function, um, which is supposed to return something that looks like Python code. So the Python code that would make the value x. Okay, so this thing here returns a list of strings, and if you want to be more specific, the strings are representations of the elements of the, the list A. Okay, here's another function. Um, it returns a, uh, a comprehension, a list comprehension. So what happens if I call this thing with a string like this? Yeah, so when we When we iterate over a string, which is what's uh, happening here for C in this string, um, what happens is we get each character one at a time. And this is just saying, well, make a, a list out of those characters. So, um, so you get you know, a list where each element of the list is a single character. And if I sort it, so same thing, I call it on a string, but I sort. Yeah. So I just get this thing sorted in alphabetical order. Um, and what was that useful for doing? We've done this, we've used this before. Uh, not so much a dictionary, but it's useful for identifying words or pairs of words that are Anagrams, yeah. So basically, if you break a string up into its, uh, into its individual characters and you sort them, 
then if two strings are anagrams of each other, well, then when you do this operation, they become exactly the same. So it's, uh, it's a trick um, for identifying anagrams, and it's more generally a trick that's used for a lot of things. Uh, when you want to identify things that are, are equal, you put them in what's called their canonical form. In this case, the canonical form of a string is uh, you split it up by its characters and you sort them alphabetically, and then if two things have the same canonical form, they're anagrams of each other. Okay. Um, another function that does a list comprehension. So what does it return? What's that? Um, well, so what if I call this with, uh, you know, with some argument like, let's, what if I call this with some argument like uh, one, two, three, and then I call derp of A? Won't work. Why not? Yeah, because for each element, it's actually going to check if the, if the length is less than or equal to 10. So that means that this thing must be expecting its elements to have a length. And so its elements then must either be strings or other lists or something that has a, a natural length. So, okay. So it's expecting strings or arrays inside this array A. And then... Uh, so what does it return? Two arrays? Mm, no. Nope. Oh, okay. Yeah. It will return a. Well, it will. It'll return. Not. I wouldn't necessarily call it a two D array because if A contains strings, then it returns a an array of strings, for instance. Um, so it returns all the strings or all of the uh, things in there in A whose length is less than or equal to 10. And it doesn't just return them normally, but it multiplies them by 2 first. And since they're lists or strings, multiplying them by 2 means that they're, they're made twice as long. So uh, you, you get a pair of them back, stuck back to back. Okay, here's another function that uses one of these tricks that we started using uh, a lot in the last few classes. Um, so what happens if I call it with the value 4? starting at the deepest part. So if x is 4, what's x mod 10? 4. And if I convert that to an int, it's still 4. And then what's a at 4? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So if you give it the integer 4, it returns the string f-o-u-r. How about if I call it with the argument 17? So, 7. So, x mod 17 mod 10 is what? 7. seven. Um, turn that to an int, it's still 7. And then look at a at position 7. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Seven. Indeed, it returns the string S-E-V-E-N. Um, 84? 4. Math.pi? 3. Okay. So, pi mod 10 is just pi, and then, um, then we convert pi to an int, 
Converting a float to an int just truncates it, so we just get the 3. Um, so we get a at 3, which is 3. If we had left out this call to converting it to an int, it would give us an error. Okay, here's some interesting code. <coughs> Um, this is something that you will sometimes see uh, some Python programmers do, uh, especially ones that come from a background of programming in another language. Uh, so, function called comp takes two arguments, x and y, and uh, so what happens if I call it with x equals 1 and y equals 2? So where do you start even with this? this thing. So what is this highlighted piece of code here? It's a list. And what's in that list? Two strings, right? So this is a list of two strings. So when I have a list and I put some square braces after it, what am I doing? What's that? No. I'm indexing. Right. So this is like, you know, let's call this first thing A, and this is saying A, give me the element of A at some position. Now the position that I'm asking for is the position x less than y. So what kind of value is that? It's true or false. And true is another word for what? What's that? Boolean. Boolean. It's named after a guy named Boole. So what is, uh, what's, uh, what does one mean? Or what is, true means one. And so, um, so Boolean values are false or true, and those get treated as zero or one. So this result in here is either going to be a zero or a one, depending on whether x is less than y or not. So if x is not less than y, uh, you get a 0. And if x is less than y, you get a 1 here. Okay. So we have this array with two strings in it. We index it with a 0 or a 1. That's good, because it only has indices 0 and 1. It only has two elements. And so when we do that, what kind of value do we get? So if I take this thing and say at zero, what do I get? X is squared or equal to y. Well, I get this string here exactly, right? Just if I take this array and ask for at position zero, this is the string I get. Yeah. And if I ask at position one, this is the string I get. Um, and notice that these strings in both cases have these printf markers inside them. So the result of all of this is a string, and then I apply the printf operator to, to fill in the values and say fill in those markers with x and y. So if we do this with x equals 1 and y equals 2, then x is less than y. Indeed, 1 is less than 2, so this is true or 1 which gives us this string here, which then fills in the values 1 and 2. So it will print 1 is less than 2. If I do it the other way around, then I'll get this thing is false. So I'll get this thing at position 0, which says this thing is bigger than or something is bigger than or equal to something else. In this case, it'll say 2 is bigger than or equal to 1. Yeah. No, because uh, if x is equal to y, then x is less than y is false. 
So that will give you a zero, and it'll give you this side of the expression here. And indeed, you know, if I take x equals 2 and y equals 2, 2 is bigger than or equal to 2, because it's equal. Um, and you can figure out what happens if you do, uh, if you do hello world with that. You give it the two arguments, hello and world. OK. Um, so one of the things that there were a little bit of problems with on the midterm uh, is, uh, and in general, there's just a, a problem with young computer scientists uh, knowing, understanding aliasing uh, is this, you know, we have these arrays, and when is one array identical, and when is it, is it not identical? So let's, let's work through this, uh, this list of code. And what I would like to keep track of as each line of code executes is what are the contents of this array A? So we start out, and the contents of A are these three strings, apple, orange, banana. Now, if, you're, uh, if you have some question like this on an exam and you're working through it, what would you do? You know, if it gets really tricky, what would you do? Would you keep track of it in your head? Probably better off to take some of the, to write on the exam paper and maybe make a little picture to keep track of what's going on. So one of these box and uh, these pictures with the boxes for the variables to, to see what's, what's happening. Okay. So next line of code says B is equal to this slice of A. So does that change the value of A? So that doesn't change anything inside this array A. Now I say B at 1 equals grape. Does that change the value of A? No. And it doesn't because this slice operator actually makes a copy of everything that's in uh, A. And so it's really making a whole different array that gets assigned to B. So A and B point refer to completely different arrays. So changing B has no effect on, on A. OK, so now I say C equals A. So now C and A both refer to the same array in memory. And now I say C equals 1, 2, 3. What happens to A? So um, this is a bit of a trick question. Nothing happens to A. So basically, so intuitively, I don't know if it's because you know that this question is supposed to eventually something's supposed to happen to A, and here you think it's about to happen, but, uh, but no. I mean, all that happens is uh, we had A refers to some array that contains three strings. Now we define C and say that's equal to A, so it refers to the same array. And then the next line we say C equals 1, 2, 3. Well, this just creates an array 1, 2, 3 and says, OK, C you don't refer to that anymore, you refer to this now. So it has, still has no effect on A. Yeah? Um, at which point? Before doing this? So, yeah, so if I decide, so what do you mean by change A? No, if I set A equals 1, 2, 3, then all that happens is the picture will then look like this. So 
this assignment operator, all it does is, uh, is change the value inside the, the box um, that the variable refers to. So when I say A gets assigned 1, 2, 3, that changes the value in the box for A. It doesn't change the array. Yeah? Yep. Yep. So when A and C refer to the same array, if I do something like A at 1 equals hello, well, that's also C also gets affected. So it's the same array. So that'll change this value here, and, uh, and that they both share that value. Okay, so, and now, what happens if I change the value of C at 1? Nothing. Nothing. C refers to this totally separate array again. All right, now D equals A. D at 1 equals blueberry. Does that do anything to A? Yes. Yes, finally. So this thing here changes from orange to blueberry. Now D at 1 equals D at 2. Does that do anything to A? Yes. What does it do? Yeah. So D at 2, that's the right hand side, is banana. And D at 1 is stored here. So this actually becomes banana. And now if I say D equals D at 1, does that change the value of A? No. no. D now just stops referring to A. It refers to actually just this string here that happens to be inside of A. Um, but that doesn't hurt, that doesn't affect A, and changes to whatever I do to D now is not going to bother A. Okay, uh, here's a class hierarchy question. I'm not going to go over it uh, because it's not a good, well, it's not a good, uh, uh, there's just a technical issue that we can't get the whole question on the screen. But um, it's really about, you know, you have three classes, parent class and two subclasses. Each one defines some methods and not some other methods. And so if I call, you know, if I create instances of these classes, um, I would like you to know, you know, which method is being called. So the classes in this case are person, musician, and office drone, and, uh, and I just want you to be able to answer, uh, you know, questions about if two things are equal or, or not. If they're equal, if they're identical, um, all of that stuff. Okay, um, here's four implementations of something you guys have written, uh, the negated function. Um, and so tell me about the running time of this function if the uh, length of the array is n. So what's the running time of this version of the negated function? Yeah, it's actually O of n squared. Because just checking if minus x is in A means you have to go all the way through A looking for minus x. So that already takes, you know, n steps to look for minus x in A. And this doesn't just happen once, but it, also, it happens for every single value x in A. So n times you do this checking if something is in A, so that, and that takes n times, so it's n times n, or O of n squared. Um, here's the second version where I first create a set, and Instead of checking if x is in A, I check if it's in the set. 
So how long does it take to check if something is in the set? Constant time. So now this takes constant time, and it gets executed n times, so it's O of n. Now what about this step of creating the set? So I take A and I turn it into a set. How long does that take? Nope. So it's not O of 1. You see, that wouldn't make sense because we have to take every element in A and put it in that set. So how long does it take to add something to a set? Nope. Sets are really fast. So you can add, remove, and check if something is in a set all in constant time. In this case, we're adding n things to a set, so it's going to take O of n time. So when you answer these kinds of questions, do a little sanity test to see if it makes any sense at all, right? So if you say, um, you know, making the set takes constant time, is that even, I mean, is that remotely possible? It's not, um, right? I have this list that has n elements, and I want to put them all into a set. There's no way I can do that faster than O of n time. Uh, I mean, I, I have to look at every element to, to put it in this, this set. Um, here's another version that does it slightly differently. It iterates over S and then uses A to check if minus X is in the set. What's the running time there? So is this a good use of the set? No, it's terrible. Um, in particular, if everything in A is distinct, so there's no equal elements in A, then the set and A contain exactly the same elements. They have exactly the same length. They all have n things. And then you're using this, this check if minus x is in A. Well, that's the slow thing. That's the thing that takes n time. So this will take O of n squared. And then the final version where it uses the sets to iterate, the set to iterate over n to do the checking, um, you know, this takes O of n time. So the total time for negated n or negated 2, is that O of n or O of n squared or negated 2? O of n. So O of n plus O of n is. Uh, is, is O of n, right? Remember what it means? O of n means it's smaller than some constant times n. So one, some constant times n plus some constant times n means that it's some other constant times n. Okay. So uh, taking two things that are O of n and adding them together is fine. You get O of n. Taking two things that are O of n and multiplying them, you get O of n squared. Okay, and to make sure we understand the sort of basics of analyzing these things, uh, tell me the running times of all these little blocks of code here. So x and y are integers, and a is an array or a list of length n. Um, how long does it take to uh, evaluate the code x plus y squared? Constant time. So O of 1. How long does it take to append something, a single value, to the end of a list? Constant time. So it actually doesn't matter how long the list is. If you're only adding one thing to the end, it takes constant time. Here I am taking a list and multiplying it by n. How long does that take? So let's check, let's do a sanity check. Could it be constant time? What's the result of this thing? If I take a list and multiply by an integer, I get, I get a list with n elements. Is it possible? Can you imagine a world where you can create a list with n elements in time that has nothing to do with n? Yeah, so it's O of n. In fact, you can just think of it as starting with an empty list and appending 
uh, one to it repeatedly. How about if I take a slice of a list? So the full slice, in fact. Yeah. So this just makes a copy of every single item in this list. So that's O of n. And what if I take a slice only of the first half of the list? Yeah, so you could say O of n divided by 2, but remember the point of big O notation is that there's some constant in there that you don't feel like specifying. So if I take that constant and I multiply it by a half, that just gives me another constant. And so I don't even need to include this divided by 2 thing. Okay. So big O notation forgets about differences that are only a constant factor. So um, in big O notation, slicing the full list or slicing half the list, that takes the same amount of time. And what about a simple, uh, a simple list comprehension like this? So the thing to check is um, this part of the list comprehension is something that you compute for each value. Well, in this case, you're not computing anything. You're just saying return whatever value happened to be in A. So look out for that. So that only takes constant time for each element. And then check this part of the comprehension, the condition. And you need to figure out how long it takes to check that condition. Well, again, that's an easy one. It's just checking if it's bigger than 0. So that takes constant time. Um, and so both checking the condition and computing this new value take constant time. So really all that matters is how many times you do it, which is the, this, this loop bit. Uh, n times. Okay. Um, here's an interesting block of code. You set i equal to n, and as long as i is bigger than or equal to 1, you set i equal to i divided by 2. So how long does that take? Yeah. Yeah. So remember, our working definition of log n is the number of times I can divide n by 2 before the result is less than or equal to 1. So with our working definition, actually, this takes log n time. In fact, this line of code here executes exactly log n times. OK. Here's the same piece of code. Except you do one more thing, <coughs> one more thing in this loop. You, uh, you do a list comprehension over the array A inside this loop. So what does that do to the running time? Uh, well, so this just by itself is a list comprehension over A, so it's n, right? Yeah, so n is just the length of A, let's say. So this takes O of n time just to execute once, and it executes log n times. So it takes n times log n is the, the total running time here. And it executes log n times because we already analyzed this, this top part. And that's what we figured out in the, the previous exercise. OK. Um, here's a simple loop. For z and a, print z. How long does that take? O of n. We don't do anything fancy. It's a loop that executes n times. Uh, we don't do anything fancy in the loop. Okay, here's another one. For z equals a, or for z in a, if minus z equals 50, print z. How long does that take? Yeah. Same thing, O of n. It's a little bit more complicated, the work that we're doing in there, but it's still all constant time stuff. Here's a third version. For z in a, if minus z is in a, print z. 
So this is the old n squared because this is not such a simple thing anymore. This is checking if some value is in, an, is in a list um, and that means you have to go through the list looking at it one element at a time. Um, for y and a, for, for z and a, for y and a, if y equals z, print z times y. So how long does that take? So this loop executes n times. Every time it executes, this loop executes, which also executes n times. So we're getting O of n squared. And what you do inside of those two loops is only constant time. Here's a slight variant of that, um, where I takes on all the indices in A, and J takes on all the indices from I plus 1 up to, uh, up to the length of A. So does that make it any faster? It's not quite as many indices, but it's, it's still O of n squared. And uh, the way to think of it is, uh, you know, on average, in fact, half the time, i is smaller than the length of a over 2, which means j still has to go over half the elements uh, in all of those, those cases. Here's a variant with three loops. i goes over the length of a, j goes over the, from i to the length of a, and k goes from j to the length of a. How long does that take? Yeah. So this is basically, you know, the first loop executes n times, the second, the inner loop executes n times each time the first loop executes, and then the, the inner inner loop executes n times each time the, the, the second inner loop executes. So you get n cubed. Um, here's one, a little bit trickier. Uh, so while the length of A is bigger than or equal to 1, we chop A and we take only the first half. So how many times does this loop execute? So A starts out with its length being equal to N, and then we make A half the size. And then we make it half the size again. And then we make it half the size again. And we stop when the length is, uh, is less than 1. And so this executes log N times. Now, how long does it take to make this slice? O of n, right? So by taking a and it, uh, I'm taking the first half, so I'm taking a slice of the first half, so everything up to position length of a over 2. So this takes uh, O of n time each time it executes. So the answer seems to be O of n log n. So that's the, that's the sort of obvious bound. But actually, if we look at this a little more closely, we can show that it's even smaller than this. It's not really n log n. Um, so let's, let's take a closer look at this. So the first time that this loop executes, how big is this slice? So if the length of A starts out being equal to N, how big is this slice that we take here? So it's the length of A over 2, right? So it's N over 2. Okay, and if N over 2 is still bigger than or equal to 1, this will execute again. And how many times, or how big is the slice that we'll take now? 
Yeah, so now the length of A is actually only n over 2, and so this slice is only of size n over 4. And what happens the next time we go through this loop? How big is this slice? So length of A is n over 4, and we take half of it, so that's a slice of size n over 8. And the next time, n over 16. And then this will go on for a while until the length of A is, uh, is 1, and we slice it and we get nothing, and then it's over. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's just write this equation another way and say that this is n times one half plus one quarter plus one eighth plus one sixteenth plus one over n. Right. So just factor out the n here uh, because it appears in all of these things and you get one half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth. Uh, all the way up to 1 over n. So this 1 half plus 1 quarter plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth all the way up to 1 over n. What does that add up to? Mm, log n? No. So anybody ever heard of, uh, of this philosopher named Zeno? Yeah, so Zeno made lots of little puzzles, logic puzzles for people to solve. And one of them is probably the most famous one. They call it Zeno's Paradox. It talks about a man who's running a race, a uh, foot race. It's a marathon, I guess. And uh, he says, well, if I want to finish, if this man ever is going to finish the marathon, the first thing he has to do is run halfway. Um, okay, so then he gets, he runs halfway, half the marathon, and, uh, and what's left is still half a marathon. So to finish that, he'll have to run a quarter marathon. And how much is left after that? Another quarter, yeah. Now, if he wants to finish that quarter marathon, he first has to run an eighth marathon. And what's left is still another eighth marathon. And if he wants to finish that, he first has to run a sixteenth of a marathon, and then there's still a sixteenth of a marathon left. So the paradox, which is nonsense, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's nice to remember these things, um, is that the guy never gets there. Right? Every time he has to still run half of whatever is left, um, and then he's still left with as much as he just ran in that, that phase. Now, the paradox breaks because, well, each time takes him half as long as the previous. I mean, it's, it, it takes half as long to run that distance. But the point is, if I add up a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth and so on, I'll actually never get to one. Um, so that sum never, gets, never makes it all the way to one. You never get to the full marathon by adding things up that way. Um, and so this thing is uh, less than or equal to n. Right, so this part is less than or equal to 1. You multiply it by n, you get something less than or equal to n. In fact, it's strictly less than, and in fact, if you care, it's actually 1 minus 1 over n uh, times n, which is just n minus 1. Okay, so all of that to say that this... Uh, this simple looking algorithm here, if you analyze it carefully, uh, the amount of work that you do is actually only O of n. And the reason is that the work that you do at each step, it starts out being n over 2, but then it gets smaller by a factor of 2 at each step after that. Okay. Um, so I want to look at a couple of uh, recursive functions. So these are the things that in last year's exam people had the most difficulty with. 
And uh, so I don't want you guys to make the same mistake. So with multiple choice Scantron, it's very easy to get into a rhythm of reading the question, reading the answers quickly and seeing the correct answer, reading, seeing the correct answer, reading, seeing the correct answer. And then you get to some hard questions and somehow you want to keep that rhythm going, but you can't. You, you, uh, you just have to stop and sit down sometimes and think hard about questions. So even though, you know, there's only five options and all it takes is, uh, is a little bit of, uh, of pencil lead to mark one of those options off, these things can take some time to, to work through. And so uh, let's take a look at, uh, at this, this particular thing. This is our version of binary search that uh, we, we did in, in we, we tried to do in class and there was a problem with it. So it's a recursive version of binary search that, uh, that operates on, uh, on an array A of length n. Uh, so two questions about it. What is the recursion depth? So if I call this starting with the initial array of length n, how many levels of recursion will there be? What's that? Uh, no, I mean that would be the maximum number of, of uh, levels of recursion, but what I mean, so let's look at what this does. It checks if the length of A is zero, and if it is, it returns false. So um, if you give it an input of size zero, it returns false. Otherwise, it uh, takes the middle element of the array, the one end position length of A over two, and checks if, you know, the thing you're looking for is less than or bigger than, and in either case, it returns, it recurses on the first half of the array or on the second half of the array. So if I start out with an array of length n, in one step, I will be recursing on an array of length n over 2. So how many times can I do that before I get down to an empty array or an array with only one element? So we log n. Right? Start with an array of length n. I turn it into an array of length n over 2. Next step, that will become an array of length n over 4, and then n over 8, and so on. You get, do that log n times, eventually the array becomes empty. Um, so the recursion depth is O of log n. Now, the question then asks about the running time of this function. So with binary search, we were hoping for a running time of O of log n, but on our first try, which was this thing, we didn't get it. So what was wrong with this thing? Why was it not giving us our log n running time? What's the inefficient part of this code here? I mean, it only makes log n recursive calls. That's great. But we're doing something in this code that takes a long time. Yeah, right here, for instance. We call this with an array of length n, um, and let's say we discover that x is in the first half of that array. Well, then we take a slice that includes all of the first half. So we're copying n elements, which means already this takes, we're copying n over 2 elements, so taking this slice here takes order n time. And that's never going to lead to log n because order n is already way bigger than log n. So already in the first step, this, uh, this taking this slice takes order n time. And then we even have to do that recursively. So we're never going to hit log n. And so the running time, you could say, well, there's log n levels of recursion. At each level, uh, we do this slice, which takes order n time. So you could say the running time is order n log n. But actually, we've just seen a better way to analyze that kind of function. If I do, 
if in the first step I take a slice of size n over 2, and the next step is a slice of size n over 4, and the next step is a slice of size n over 8, and so on, all of that only adds up to uh, order m. So the recursion depth is log n, but the running time is, uh, is order m. So not very good. In particular, um, what's the point of using binary search if the running time is order n? I could have just scanned through the array looking for it. Um, okay, so let's skip to a slightly more sophisticated one. Quick analysis of this recursive function here. Um, so, simple function, if the length of A is 1, we return the, the single value that's in A. Otherwise, we call this function on the first half of the array, and we call this function on the second half of the array. So, suppose I start out with an array of length 8. So let's draw that. I start out with some array A whose length is 8. So according to the definition of this function, uh, so the length is not 1, so I should recurse on the first half of the array. How big is the first half of the array if the length of the array is 8? 4. And 4 is not equal to 1, so by the definition of this function, I should recurse on the first half of that. How, uh, how big is that? 2. And 2 is not equal to 1, so by definition, I should recurse on the first half of that, which is 1. Okay. So that's done. That returns. So now I'm done recursing on the first half of this array of length 2. Now I have to recurse on the second half. So the second half is also an array of length 1. That returns right away. And now I'm done recursing on the first half and the second half. I return this. I, the function says just return whatever results you got from those two things. So that brings us back up to here, where we were working on an array of length 4, and we just finished the first half. So now it's time to do the second half. And we have to do the first half of that, and the second half of that, before we can return, and return. And then finally this is done. We get back up to the top, where we're working on an array of length 8, and we've just finished the first half. So now we do the second half. And we know what that looks like now. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the recursion tree for this function. So it finishes when this returns, and the whole thing uh, the whole thing finishes. So the the question wants to know a couple of things. Uh, what is the depth of recursion for this function when I call it with the value 8? What's that? 3 or 4, depends how you want to measure it. Let's say 3. So uh, recursion depth 0, 1, 2, 3. So when n equals 8, Depth equals 3. Um, okay. And what about if it was more general? What if it was m? Log n. Because it gets smaller by a factor of 2 each time. Okay. So if you just have n, then you get recursion depth log n. And now the question asks about the running time. So where is all the work happening? Well, the work happens that every time we recurse on a problem, we have to take a slice of the first half and a slice of the second half. 
So if the problem has size n, that means we're slicing n elements in total. So for example, at the root here, we're taking a slice of the first half, and then the second half, that's a total of eight elements. At this guy here, we're taking a slice of the first half, that's two elements. A slice of the second half is two elements, that's four elements. In fact, at every node in this tree, we're taking the, the amount of work we're doing slicing is, uh, is just equal to the label on that node. And now notice that if I add these up across each level, I keep getting the same value. So here I get 8. Here I get 8 again. Here I get 8 again. So here I'm getting something like 8 times 3 plus 1, so the recursion depth plus 1, um, which is whatever, 32. Now what would happen in the more general case where the size of the array is not 8, but n? So I get n's at all of these nodes, n over 2's at these nodes, n over 2's here, n over 4's, n over 4's, n over 4's. But whenever I add them up across the levels, I keep getting the same result. It's n. And the number of levels is log n. So the total work that I get in all nodes of the recursion tree is n log n. So there's how you analyze that kind, of, uh, that kind of algorithm by drawing its recursion tree, figuring out how much work is done at each node, and then adding up all of that, uh, that work. And so to prepare for the exam now, just go through, do the rest of these exercises, talk about them on the forums if you have any questions or issues, and... Uh, and uh, well, good luck on the exam in 10 days. <laughs>